It's going to okay. go live. And then on that way, live stream. it gave me a warning that it was being live streamed. Yes. <gasps> it's funny. Which is nice because that way yeah. you can't film you without. Okay, good. I got the notification, which means it is coming up. Okay, good. So, yeah. I always get the warning too, even though I'm the one like live streaming it. That's funny. Um, yes. Wow. Celine's already there. Hello, Celine. <laughs> and Sarah, Sarah Turner's on too. Wow. People are popping on fast today. So as you guys can see, we were chit chatting right when we joined, but this is, I am here today and she just joined. So this is like, boom, 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 really fast. So yep. Dina, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I had not asked you yet. So all right. Good to see you. Thank you for joining me today. It's been a little while and I've had, um, many requests. Hey, Kaylin, I've had many requests that you join me again. So well, that's nice to hear. Yes. And to be back. I know you're one of your most, um, talked about subjects that you do is just, you know, raising a child with autism or special needs. Yeah. Um, and so maybe we'll have you on, you know, later this year to continue talking about that because, okay. you know, as Sam grows, it's kind of nice seeing you go through the progress of raising Sam. And this is his senior year. Can you believe it? I know it. No, right. he was, how old was he when we met you? He's well, been that's now. been five years, I guess. So uh, it was just, you know, not even, he was 12, I guess. Yes. That's just uh, a little boy. He was, he was a little yeah. boy. So it's been really neat seeing him grow up and grow up in your home and really excel and do well. And he is doing really well being homeschooled and his music lessons and everything. So he is. Thank really you. Nice. Right. Hi, Angelie. It's nice to see you in the chat. She is Angelie is from England. So it's yes. nice to have her. her. Her from Facebook. Yep. Yes. And Beth and Ashley. Lots of familiar faces. So I hope you guys are all having a good summer. But we kind of threw this together. Um, honor and no, always favorite. do that. It seems like we always do that. Just throw yeah. it together. We do. <laughs> we just throw it together and we'll see what happens. But um, Miss Dana, how long have you been a Christian? Okay. So I'm, I've, I think I've shared this before on your show. I know, I know I've shared it somewhere. I made a profession of faith when I was six years old in my church, you know, at Buffalo Heights Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Church, where I was raised, grew up there. Uh, I was baptized then. I grew up in church, always been in church, you know, my entire life. I was a three to thrive, you know, literally my entire life. I, when I was 23, I sort of had, uh, heard a few sermons and, you know, was listening to some independent Baptist preachers and felt like that I didn't really understand salvation or that I had not prior to, because I was that kid that, you know, all through my teenage years was always rededicating my life. And, you know, maybe I wasn't really saved and just always seriously doubting. So when I was 23, um, I was baptized again. I talked to my pastor after a revival that we had at church and I talked with my pastor. And I was like, you know, I don't know that I was saved, you know, when I was young. And he assured me that, you know, it takes just a very small measure of faith, you know, to be saved. And it's likely I was, but if I felt like I needed to pray again, then let's pray and we'll baptize you again. And that way we nail it down. So that's exactly what I did. I was 23 years old when I for surely nailed it down and I haven't doubted it a day since. So, you know, whether or not I was saved before then, I can't really say the Lord knows, but I know for a fact, you know, after I, that time when I was 23, that I'm forever saved. So I've been in church my entire life. I can't, you know, there've been very few times in my life that I've not been actively involved in a church somewhere. And that's kind of similar to my story. I was saved when I was four. I never, um, I always knew I had been saved then you know, at that point in my life. Now I will say through my teenage years due to some bad, I call it camp meeting type preaching yeah. where, well, if you just struggle with this sin, you're probably not saved, you know, bad, <clears throat> bad teaching like that. There were times I, I doubted a little as far as, Oh, you know, why am I struggling with this? Am I, you know, am I really safe? But yeah. due to good preaching, you know, I came to figure out that yes, I truly was saved you know, it's not repenting right. your sins that gets you saved. It's uh, like you said, just a little bit of faith, right? So yes. believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, all that. So if you guys have any questions, I do have someone that has been watching my show that was, um, I believe, 
she was raised Catholic and she's really having a hard time coming to the terms of just accepting that it's a free gift with no strings attached. I wonder. Um, yeah. So she's really struggling with grasping that. So if any of you ladies are having doubts, please reach out to me or Dana, you know, we'll be sure to tell you exactly what it takes to being saved. And it's, it's so simple and Christ made it simple. So I always want to throw that, um, out there. So Yes, anyway, right. but yeah, so we, I have been a Christian now I'm 41. So over 30, what, 36 years, 37 years. Yeah. I've been saved. So, you know, being, getting from, it takes no, you know, we come as we are to Christ, right. And we accept his free gift of salvation. The process after that of becoming a successful Christian does right. work though. <laughs> yes. The sanctification is where the work's at. So yeah, exactly. So I wanted to talk today just about, um, you know, becoming a successful Christian. And there have been examples in my own life that I'm kind of drawing off of. I'm definitely not using myself as an example, but I'm using examples of people that have gone on before me, women that I looked up to when I was 20 and getting married, and they are still, you know, in the ministry, not even in the ministry, serving in their church. This is not even all pastor's wives. This is just regular Christian women you know, serving in their church with a zeal for the Lord, faithful to their husbands, faithful to their children. And, um, these, I know I've had some of them on the show, you know, some of my heroes, which Jane, Jane was one of them. Um, um, I'm trying to think my, you know, Pam Graham was another one. Um, even Matt first's wife, just everything. He's done. So there's so many that I've had on the show. So you kind of see a little bit of my heart through them, but what are some successful women in your life that you've looked up to? My Sunday school teacher comes to mind. She's 91. She's still alive. She lives less than five minutes from our church. And so we see her periodically, you know, when we're over that way, her name is Dolores Brewer. And uh, my friend Wanda and I, my longtime friend Wanda, we always say we want to be Dolores when we grow up. So she's been serving the Lord in the same church for well over 55 years, taught Sunday school literally until COVID, like literally until COVID. And, you know, with the whole COVID thing and the elderly people, you know, being afraid to come to church, that's when she finally stepped down. It was really sad that, you know, that happened because I think she's still completely capable other Mm -hmm. than, you know, not being able to get around driving as much, but she still is at church every week. So Miss Dolores, she's like the first soul winner that I ever knew. She's the first, you know, person I saw that actively gave the gospel at church in a church setting. I'm at, I grew up SBC. So I never did soul winning growing up. You know, we called it witnessing and that's what the missionaries did, but our Sunday school teachers and GA teachers and training union teachers, those people are the ones who were, you know, sharing the gospel with kids in church. So she's the first person that I actually saw, you know, getting people saved and, you know, bringing kids to be baptized at church. She's just a wonderful inspiration to me. And she's still such a fantastic lady. Always, you know, has a joyful spirit, always super positive, still will call me to this day just to check on Tristan. How's Tristan doing? I haven't heard from you. So she, she ranks right at the top of my list. And then I wrote down my mom and my mom's best friend, Mary Frances Hurst, who is just a lovely lady. My mom and Mary Frances have served in the same church for over 40 years. And I laughed just last week. They were out there in, you know, it's like a hundred degrees down here right now. So hot. And they're out there doing the flower beds at the church and, you know, repotting, you know, all the flowers and mulching and Mary Frances is 80 and my mom will be 70 at the end of this month. And I was like, mama, is there not somebody else that can do this? At the and she's like, but I love it. And she said, and when I get hot and tired, she said, I look at Mary Frances and say, well, if she can do it, then so can I, because she's wow. 10 years her senior. So, wow. you know, that may be looked at as a minor thing, but my mom and my dad, you know, served diligently in the church. They've done everything for years and years and years, and they're glowing examples of people who do it without complaint. So that's people that come to my mind in my life. That's awesome. So I wanted to kind of go over the definition of success. Um, Most of the things I saw were like, um, like this first meeting degree or measure of succeeding. Okay. Well then what does succeeding mean? You know, what does succeeding mean in your, in your life? But I like the second one favorable or desired outcome. Yeah. We all have, the Lord has a favored and desirable outcome for all of us with our lives, with our Christian lives. And we should have a favorable or desired outcome in our mind. What are you, you know, what are, what is the goal? You know, 
for me, in my mind, success would be reaching the goal that I've set. I don't know. What, what does it mean to you? I guess if I'm thinking success, you know, in the Christian life, I look at my position and my position is as a wife and a mother. So success to me is raising up children who continue that legacy, children who will continue to be in church. Um, Grayson and I talk about this a lot. We, you know, over the last two years, especially the goal has become at our church. You know, yes, we want to see the law saved. You know, yes, we want people, you know, to be there. Yes, we want it to be a great place. But more than any anything else, we want our church to be a place where the children love to be where the children are safe and they're comfortable and they're happy and they're learning and they're growing in the Lord and they want to be there because he and I both had great experiences growing up in church. And I really think that that has been paramount in keeping us going, you know, and keeping us active. It was a way of life for both of us. And so we want that in our own church. And I definitely want that for my kids. You know, if my kids hate going to church, they're not going to continue in church when they're grown. You know, so my goal as, you know, in my opinion, to be a successful mom, a successful wife, that's to make sure that my children never lose sight of what's important. And that's serving the Lord on this earth because everything else is vanity. Everything else is just futile. So to me, that is a successful Christian life. If I can just continue it on in my family. And I would say the same thing for me. Any of anyone that watches my shows knows that um, for me, being a successful wife, you know, long-term marriage till death do us part um, and happy at that, you know, not just, (laughs) yeah, not a miserable marriage. And then just with the kids, them continuing on, you know, I want to see them all in church. Does that mean that I want my boys to be pastors? No, not necessarily. I I want them to be in God, in the center of God's will, happy and loving church. I don't want them to dread church. I I feel the same exact way as you when it comes to that, but success is definitely a long-term um, thing that we have to work for. And I think for me, one of the most important things for me would be ending well, you know, ending, ending the life. Well, not just going on little spurts here and there falling, yeah. away, going on little spurts, falling away, but being faithful until the very, very end. Yeah. So I don't know. What do you feel about that? Well, I think consistency is the key to just about anything. I think that, you know, building habits, building, you know, a consistent way of life, staying the same uh, is very important because, you know, well, we live in this society where nobody really sticks with anything anymore, you know, especially in church. People just sort of and, and I say this from a place of experience, you know, Grace and I went through a big season where we hopped around everywhere, you know, never satisfied couldn't find a great church, you know, everything was just falling short. And so, you know, we sort of did the church hop for a while. And I I think I've said this on your show before too, that was during a very critical time for my oldest, you know, it was during those, you know, teenage years where he was very impressionable, very vulnerable, very just, you know, emotional. And we didn't have that security of being plugged into one place and serving in one spot. Yes. We've always been in church, but we've not always been consistent in the same place. And so our goal now is to keep that consistency, you know, especially with our younger boys, Samuel is happy anywhere, anytime, you know, no matter what, but our little guys who are now just coming up, we, they're never going to know anything else, but their dad being a pastor, really, you know, Levi five years ago, Levi was, you know, six. So, and Ollie was just a little bitty, you know, just three years old. So this is kind of all they've known. So we want to continue that that way you know, it's, it's, it's all they know. It's, it's consistency. I can't remember how we even started that. What did you ask me exactly? No. On. Yeah. No. <laughs> You're doing great. What success means to you, you know, ending well, but I, I also think um, success is definitely a long process. And yes. Pastor Boyle preached a really good sermon at our church last week. If anyone right. wants to check it out called yes. little by little. Oh, I didn't hear that one. I heard the one of uh, your excuse. Yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah. <laughs> They're both really good. He's a great preacher, but your excused is also a good one. Basically talking about if you have an excuse, God's going to say, fine, you're excused, but you yeah. can always come up with excuses for not serving, not being a right. church, you know, but the little by little was really good too, where he was talking about, you know, you have to, some things in life you have to build on, you know, it's little by little by little, and it's all these decisions made throughout the yeah. years. And, um, I really think that that has to do with success as well. Success is not just one day determining I'm going to be a successful Christian 
and then you don't change anything. You don't try to reach towards a goal. It's right. building. It's little by little. It's making the little decisions. I'm going to be at church at every service. You know, every time the doors are open, my kids are going to be there. You know, it's, it's little decisions like that. So what are some ways in your life that you've exactly. kind of made those little by little decisions? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is our marriage. You know, early on, Grayson and I, um, you know, we've been married 23 years at the end of this month. And when we were first married, you know, he worked in the jail and he was, you know, an officer for a really long time. So he worked around an environment that, you know, wasn't the best, just being honest, which now it seems like there's no environment that's good. But back then the police department was really bad for, you know, the rate of divorce and, you know, things like that. And he witnessed a lot of this whole divorce and remarry, even like within the department, it was really just awkward and weird. It would just blow our minds that these people would literally divorce one spouse and marry a new spouse that, and they all worked in the same place. It was really strange. Yeah. But, you know, I, I remember us talking about having these conversations about how these people would share kids and, you know, the kids would go here one weekend and here another weekend. And it was just this big hodgepodge of, you know, a mess of, dysfunctional family. And I remember him saying, let's just stay married. How about we just stay married forever? We just, we just commit to this thing, no matter what, if we're ready to kill each other, you know, we're just, we're just going to tough it out, you know, kind of jokingly, but honestly enough that it, we both still reference that conversation periodically when we're talking to younger couples or talking to people that haven't been married very long. And, I think that was a huge, like just shift in the way that we thought about things at that time that, you know, we were not going to just flippantly give up. And I know at times in the last 23, 23 years when we have had trouble because we have had trouble, you know, everybody has trouble. We have both gone back to that conversation and said, you know what? We're not giving up. We're not going to give up. We're not throwing in the towel. There's too much at stake to give up. And, you know, it's just not worth it. So I think that is, you know, probably the first point that I could remember where I dug my heels in. I mean, aside from going to church, because that honestly is a huge thing for me too. being raised in church, being brought up in church. It was just there was no question that I was going to raise my kids in church. You know, I wanted to be there all the time. I love church. I still love church. So that's two areas of my life where we have said this is the way it's going to be. And we're not going to change that. And so I think that's very important. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would say the same for me as well. Um, and then I was going to say, I was going to big piggy bank off. Something came to mind when you were talking. What was it? I'm like looking at the chat. Oh, I was going to ask this question that Angela asked. She said, how do you build up consistency when it feels like every area of your life needs changing? Oh, goodness. Well, you have to start small. I'm actually reading a book. This is so funny that you would ask this. Hold on. It's right behind me in my bookshelf here. (laughs) This little book is called, this uh, episode is brought to you by Tiny Habits. No, this book is called Tiny Habits. I bought it on a whim. It's very interesting. It talks about um, just taking very small steps to change big things. Uh, it's just mind boggling to me because I have a tendency to get frozen when I want to change something that seems so huge, vast, big. It's like I freeze. Oh, I can't do it. I don't know what to do. It's too big. Can't handle it. So this book sort of talks about taking things in little tiny bites, little tiny steps. So I would just, if I were giving honestly advice, I would write a list of what you want changed. You know, what areas in your life do you want to change and start with one. (laughs) Don't try to tackle all of it. It's like your to-do list. You can't tackle your entire to-do list at once. You have to start with one little thing. I would start with one area and then I would do baby steps to make a change. And then when you feel like you've tackled that area, you know, whether that, I mean, I don't know, it's going to church. Oh, I just can't be committed to church. Well, then you need to say, you know what? For the next month, I'm going to be there every service, just a month every service. And then the next month, okay, I'm going to be there every service. And then when you tackle that, you move on to the next area of your life that you think needs work. If it's a job, you know, oh, I I hate my job. It's a terrible environment. Then work toward finding something else. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. That's awesome. That's hilarious that you're reading that book. I know. (laughs) That actually is really good. And maybe one that she needs to read to kind of give her an idea of where to where to yeah, start. I can't vouch for the entire thing. I've not gotten through it yet. So don't think that I've just given it my stamp of approval and it's completely okay. But so far it seems like a really good book. 
So there'll always be books that we don't agree with hundred percent, but sure. if there's a good, you know, if there's a good, good principles throughout, then it's worth it, you know, take the meat, yeah. the bones. But I know another thing for me, um, long-term is that I have determined since the time I was young that I wanted to serve God for the long-term and that, you know, that is also built little by little, little decisions um, leading up to just serving a faithful life. So let's go into habits of success when it comes to your relationship with God, what are some things that you have done to keep your relationship, um, alive and strong and deep? Well, there, there are a few different things. Obviously you want to read your Bible and it's more than just reading a checklist, you know, checking off, Oh, I read, you know, chapter so-and-so through so-and-so today check, you know, it's so much more than that. I remember last summer, when uh, Tristan left for basic training, I was so devastated. It was just a really rough time, but we were coming out of, you know, some struggles with church and, and, you know, then Tristan leaves and it was just really traumatic. And I can't remember exactly where I was at my Bible reading, but I remember just, just bawling to grace and just, I'm so sad. I'm so sad. I don't know how to handle this. And he's like, all right, you need to start in Psalm, the book of Psalms. And he's like, you need to read a Psalm every day and go through. And he's like, I want you to write down all the promises that you find in each Psalm. And so I started that It was a very direct approach to reading my Bible. Cause I haven't really done any Bible studies in a long time. You know, that's kind of boo-booed for a while. And you never know what you're getting when you get into those, you know, it, it's, it's hard to find one that you can kind of trust. And so I'd kind of gotten out of that habit. I was just doing reading. So it was nice to be able to sit down again and have a goal in mind when I was reading my Bible, other than just I'm reading from here to here. So I, I think that's very important is to take the word of God and actually look for what you need in it. You know, of course, God's going to reveal it to you if you're looking for it. The Bible says if we ask, we're going to get it. You know, you seek and you'll find it. And I think it's very important to actually, you know, look and seek the Lord. Prayer is extremely important. Obviously, it's a no brainer. Another huge thing for me is music. And I know that sounds, you know, I don't know, maybe petty, but I love music. Um, I'm a musical person. And so I listen to a lot of spiritual music, whether that be, you know, my favorite bluegrass group that sings, you know, gospel or just some really old, you know, CCM. Oh no, that I absolutely <laughs> loved a long time ago. Like Stephen Curtis Chapman. I love him. I love his lyrics and his words. That is you know, I grew up listening to him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think the music really feeds my soul. You know, it helps me a lot. It will redirect my thoughts a lot of time. You know how you get wrapped up in your brain and you just start to think about something, you get aggravated and, you're just dwelling on it and all these negative things just, just start flooding your mind. And I can turn some music on and all of a sudden I can be in worship mode. And I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter. Whatever that, you know, worry was, it it just doesn't even matter. So I think, you know, music, listening to sermons, it's another great way to just redirect your thoughts. You know, I listened to Pastor Boyle's sermon, the one that the second one that you mentioned, you're excused. Oh my goodness sitting there just on a whim, just saw it when I pulled up YouTube and thought, I'm going to just, it wasn't very long, you know, so I'm going to just listen to that. And of course, by the end of it, I'm just crying and just (laughs) love Pastor Boyle, you know, such a great sermon. And, you know, I think that that's, you know, a way that the Lord can speak to us, you know, through the sermons, through the songs, through the Bible. And you need to be constantly putting something like that in your life, not filling up your mind with Facebook you know, with the YouTube videos, with, you know, the television, with, you know, just carnal things that don't matter. So, yep, I definitely agree. And a lot of people have, maybe they're trying to wean themselves off of worldly music and they decide to go cold Turkey. Well, that's not smart either because you need something to replace that. So, you know, a good channel is Liberty Baptist church music. We have that's right there. And then my husband has playlists of his favorite groups that he listens to. My personal pay- favorite is I have just playlists and I sent Chloe a huge playlist because she loves them. Um, any college group. So like um, Hiles, Hiles has a lot of really good music out of their college. Golden State does. Um, Heartland does. Um, there's a few really good conservative IFB colleges that are putting out good content. So and you heard Mountain, music, you heard that, Mountain is a good one too. Yes. And one thing about them is that Sometimes they'll take some of the older CCM songs that 
we listen to and the what we call they um what is it called they 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 clean it up <laughs> so yeah. they're leaving out the drums and you know all right. that stuff but they're because a lot of them do have really good words but yeah, you know, they do especially if you come from an addiction in the past where you want to get all of that out, then they kind of clean up a lot of those songs. So right. um, I found that those are my favorite, but yeah, definitely. And then um, I think when it comes to God too, one of the biggest things of be- being a successful Christian is just learning to die to the flesh, you know, right. um, saying no. And back to the word search that you were doing, I have done word searches in the Bible on different subjects. I've done word searches on anger you know, looking up every time the word anger is used in the Bible, and then just seeing what God has to say about that. I've done word searches about speech, how our speech should be, yeah, you know, edifying speech, gracious speech. Um, I've done word searches on every time the word woman is mentioned. I've (laughs) gone through and done it. And it's really interesting what you can find, you know, if you're lacking peace, do a word search on peace, and then look at all the verses that speak about peace and what comes with that. So, um, I really, I really get a lot out of those. I haven't done one in a while. I need to do another one. So, and then, um, so obviously part of success when it comes to relationship with God is also church attendance, which we've already touched on that. Um, Mm -hmm. and then just letting God control every area of your life. When the, and that, that comes partly with dying to flesh too, you know, your thoughts, your actions. Um, not all of us have arrived. We all still mess up. <laughs> so yeah. what are some things that you have done in your own life? Because you can be an, um, you can be an outspoken spitfire like myself. <laughs> what are some things <laughs> Dana's like, no, me talking about no (laughs) what are some things that you have done when you feel the urge to just set someone straight oh my goodness okay (laughs) well I have messed up and tried to set someone straight and then I've had an entire sermon series preached about me yeah Uh, honestly (laughs) I wrote this verse down when right next to dying to flesh on your outline it's Ecclesiastes 5 2 and this should be my life verse says be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before god for god is in heaven and thou upon the earth therefore let thy words be few uh i think we all struggle with this grayson's been going through the book of proverbs you know in the last few months and it's all about the tongue over and over and over and over talking 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 uh it's a huge struggle especially for a woman especially for a fiery woman like you said you know you and I we've earned that bad right oh, yes. <laughs> but I think in the past recently you know I've been dealing with some aggravations and frustrations and you know just people drama and I've tried to keep my mouth shut and just let my words be few and let time pass and hopefully let you know things just take care of themselves because a lot of times things will just take care of themselves. Things will work themselves out if you just don't jump in and have some knee jerk reaction to something. So that's a huge thing for me. Um, I don't really love confrontation, but I also don't like tension and conflict. So I tend to want to fix that if it's there in spite of despising the confrontation. Yeah. So, but lately, you know, in the past several months, well, the past year, actually, you know, since I got fried last summer with the new IFB, I've really tried to just let my words be few. And, you know, that's not to say that I don't feel like I'm justified in some of the things that I could or would say. I do feel like, you know, I I should be able to have a voice, but I also feel like, you know, a lot of times things are just better left unsaid and the Lord will, you know, he will clear my name. <laughs> he will make things right. He will take care of whatever wrong, you know, that I feel like is happening. So that that's a huge thing just to try and keep calm and keep quiet and, you know, just stay at peace with everyone. Cause a lot of times we do, you know, hastily say something and regret it or hastily say something. And, you know, it, it does damage that can't be, you know, repaired, you know, with a relationship. So I've tried to keep a mouth shut. Yeah. All that to say. <sighs> We're a work in progress. And yep. it is, it is hard not to um, want to defend those that you love. 
you know, sure. especially when you feel like it's, it's unfair and it's unjust. But one thing that I've learned when we kind of got onto the in, online, we both, my husband and I had online platforms. Um, it, I've come a long way since then. And yes. I wish I could look back five, six years ago and tell the Cassandra back then what she needed to hear, <laughs> yep. you know, and I think, um, it would just be ignoring what, ignoring the naysayers and just keeping on the path that, you know, you're supposed to be on. Exactly. So, you know, you keep doing your thing in your own church. It's all about the local church. That's what matters. You Absolutely. know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what's going on in the online world. Um, what matters is your local church. So just investing in those people invest yeah. in those relationships and God sees the heart. God knows what your true intentions are. And God will set the record straight eventually. You know, we might not even see it on the earth, but um, it will be set straight eventually. So I think that kind right. of helps. Um, I've learned through the past year or two, I, I try to keep quiet. I, I let my thoughts be few in a typed out fashion. <laughs> yeah. Whether that's YouTube comments or whatever. So um Obviously I'm not hundred percent successful, but I do, I have cut back a lot on that. So yeah, I've never regretted. Well, you know, sometimes you feel like, oh, it would just be so, I would feel so vindicated if I could just tell my side of the story, but I've never regretted just keeping quiet. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yep. So I, the same way. Yeah. But let's talk about marriage. So we, we kind of hit on this a little bit habits of okay. success of success when it comes to marriage. Um, I read a saying the other day that really struck me and I was like, Hmm, that is interesting. I, and I think I had this mindset when I first entered into marriage, marriage was going to make me happy. Right. My right. husband was there to make me happy. He was the <laughs> source of my happiness and my joy. And he was my knight in shining armor. But I read a phrase that said, does marriage exist only to make you happy or does it exist to make you holy? Yeah, so that, that really struck with me because both spouses have to work through a lot when your marriage to have a functioning marriage. They have to overlook annoyances, they have to have forgiveness, you know, all these things that will further make you a better person, in my opinion. Absolutely. You stick it out. So um, what are some things in your own marriage that you have done just to kind of make it successful, run well, whatever? Honestly, we just try to talk, you know, we try to actually talk things out, you know, and then when we need times that, you know, we shouldn't be talking, we let our words be few and we'll separate for a little while and we'll let each other cool off, which that doesn't happen a lot anymore. You know, we're not really the hotheads that we used to be, you know, we were both kind of hotheads when we were young and now we were like old and, you know, just a lot more docile. The yeah. arguments are much fewer and further between now, but I think um, more than anything else is just conversation. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Kitty. I scared my cat to death. Um, conversation, you know, making sure that we talk things out, that we share, you know, what we're feeling with each other, even if it's, you know, silly. And, you know, even if I'm having just some crazy hormonal meltdown or whatever, just actually telling him I'm having a crazy hormonal meltdown. Just please bear with me. I mean, I remember the last time that Grayson really did console me when I was just hysterical, you know, I'm hysterical over something silly. I think I might be like nearing menopause or something. I have been a little emotional lately, but I was in the laundry room and I'm just expressing all of this, just lie to him, you know, yelling at him for no reason, not at him to him, I guess we'll say, because it wasn't mad at him him and he just you know leans his back on the washer scoots down to the floor and here he goes and he preached me a sermon like a literal sermon and for 20 minutes in the laundry room not fussing at me but just telling me you know you're not doing this you're not doing this and this is what you need to be doing this is how you need to handle this and you know here's what I want you to do I felt like I got like you know the bonus sermon that week but I think that's it more than anything else is you know and and I will say this you know, it's easy to tell a young couple, oh, you need to talk, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. But a lot of the great parts of marriage, like Grayson and I have now, and I'm sure you and your husband have now, only come with time. Yeah. It takes time of dealing with each other. It takes, you know, time of learning and getting to know each other and spending time together and figuring out each other's strengths and weaknesses and what makes each other tick. And it's, I, I really think that it, 
the sweet spot of marriage is a blessing from the Lord for enduring, you know, the long haul heading up to. So I don't think it's something you just instantly get. You don't just instantly get a great marriage when you get married. It's, oh. it's a work in progress continually. Yeah. And that's another one of those little by little things, you know, little yep. by little, you get to that point where, like you said, the, the fights, <laughs> Yeah. The arguments get fewer and further between because you figured each other out. You know what's yeah. going to set the other person off. So a lot of times you just don't go there. And that was hilarious what you were saying, because that is, I don't know if it's an upside or a downside of being married to a preacher, but yeah, <laughs> we get the sermons a lot. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I don't think he meant to do that necessarily, but that's exactly what it was. I mean, he may as well have just been standing there with his Bible, just, you know, pointing at me from the pulpit because I felt about that big and he was the one in the floor and I was the one up on the chair, but I needed it. He knew exactly what I needed to hear. You know, I had somebody ask me at church, I don't know, several months ago, what's it like for your husband to be your pastor as well as your husband? Nobody had ever really asked me that. I had never really given it any thought, but I can honestly say, and I don't know, you know, how you feel or what you think, but when Grace and preaches at church he is my pastor at that point i am listening to his messages just like everybody else in the congregation i am getting my toes stepped on just like everybody else i think i've told people at my church that you know seven out of ten sermons are for me the ones that he's preaching oh that one was mine that was for me but you know i i don't i don't know i don't look at him and think whatever. But I think also that comes from a place of respect for him as my husband. He's my husband. I know my place with him. You know, I know my place in this marriage. And so it's almost like an, it's, it's like a privilege that he's also my pastor. So. Yep. That's good. Yeah, that's good. And then just realizing, I think um, some women, maybe mine too, I don't know, need to realize that that is the most human, that is the most important human relationship that there is. Yeah. Um, you know, even more than, you know, family as far Absolutely. as Absolutely. My know. mother-in-law asked me a long time ago, and I think she was kind of being catty when she asked me, she was like, who's your best friends? And I remember, you know, naming off my current best friend at the time. And she goes, it's not Grayson. I was like, oh, I mean, this has been years and years and years ago. You know, we'd probably been married three years, four years, something like that. And I was like, well, no, it's, and I, I mean, yeah, him too. You know, you try to recover. Well, yeah. now I can say Grayson is my very best friend. He's the person that I turn to for everything. He's the person that, you know, I need the most in my life. He is, like you said, the most important relationship that I have in my life is with that man who is still out there mowing the yard. Can you hear that? No, I can't. Okay, I can't good. <laughs> I cannot hear it. No, lots of good tips right there. Um, let's go on. Let's move on to children habits of success when it comes to raising children. Obviously the number one thing I think is, um, the first two points that I, well, yeah, a lot of the points, but consistency in what you do with your children and then having a good balance of love and correction. What have you seen that has worked? You have raised an adult son. He's now in the military. So I raised not use Tristan in his example. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Kristen is a wonderful kid. Tristan is like, I hope he watches this. He'll be like, what? Tristan is like the perfect combination of Grayson and I and all of our bad faults. <laughs> and I say that with love. No, I love Tristan. Tristan is actually Grayson just 20 years ago. He really is. He is, you know, no filter at all, but he is a good, a good boy. He's got a heart of gold and I, I just love him dearly. And he's in a good spot right now. So, you know, he's got a good job. He's got his dream job that he always wanted. You know, I hope that in the words of Curtis Hudson, he has not succeeded at the wrong thing, but <laughs> I'm will tell there's nothing I can do about it now, but yep. yes, I have raised a grown son and he's a good boy. Yeah. But I, what I else did you feel like to be, we are with, it's, it's like you with your spouse, you're with your spouse, you know, all the time, 24 hours a day, whatever, yep. you know, except for homeworking, you know, the faults, you know, the ins and outs. But comparatively, when you, um, you've raised a good kid, you've raised a great kid, you know, you know, all his faults. So of course you're going to be the one like, oh, well, Tris, you know, but I'm the same with my kids. But, um, when you have people in the world telling you, you have raised a great kid, you know, you've raised a great family, you know, you're doing something right. So I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. He's, he's a good man. He's a good young man. So 
Um, but yeah, I think a lot of parents think that they can raise good children without being the example that they need to be in the home, you know, sure. Do what I'm do what I say, not what I do. You know, Grayson just, yeah, Grayson just said this yesterday that parents just kind of roll the dice. Well, I hope they turn out okay. Well, you know, that's not effective parenting at all. That's not going to get you good kids. It might if, you know, I guess, you know, the stars align, but more than likely it's not going to work out in your favor at all because the world is after your kids. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. They absolutely are. And then I've always told, I don't know if I heard this. I think I did. I think my father-in-law always said this when I was um, a young mom, you know, we just, I was in his church for 10 years or something. And that was all when we had little kids. And I remember him saying, what you do, your kids are going to do in excess. Yeah, so that is your attitude, your actions, your speech, your love, forgiveness. <laughs> and, um, I, and I've seen that even in my own life, one of them being like speech. I I've told this on the story. I've told this on the show before, but my mom growing up, we weren't allowed to say like crap. Um, <laughs> yeah, <you're laughs> even, but so we weren't allowed to say, but it was like bottom or dairy air, which I think is like French for it. I don't know, but <laughs> she, she was always really picky about that. So yeah. even how I like kind of cringe when I hear my kids saying that, you know, when I hear them say those words, so I kind of cringe, but, um, I never even used those, but now my kids use those, <laughs> you know, and I don't like the slang for anything with God or Jesus, you know, I don't yeah. like the slang. I've tried to keep that out of my home as well, but yeah. I will even see that even as far as my own attitude, sometimes my kids, I'm watching them and it's kind of like an ouch moment because <laughs> I see myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I wonder where they got that from. I know where they got that from. Yes, exactly. So, Exactly. Well, my dad used to say, you said, you know, that you heard, you know, you, you can't, I can't remember how you said it. My dad used to say, you can't teach a child moderation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all things in moderation. Well, you can't, you know, if you drink alcohol in moderation, oh, I just have a beer here, have a beer there. You know, we go out socially and drink. Your kids are not going to to necessarily do that your kids are going to look at it and say oh well alcohol is completely okay mom and dad both drink when they go out or mom and dad you know, dad keeps a six-pack in the fridge it's completely okay my dad was always you know one to just adamantly abstain from anything alcoholic because he was raised in an alcoholic's home his father was an alcoholic he was beaten as a child and he just wanted absolutely nothing to do with any of it and that was always his reason don't drink because you can't teach kids moderation. And I think this goes for anything, just like you said. You know, if you make, you know, movies, certain, you know, movies or TV shows or just TV in general, you know, we just don't watch TV at our house anymore. We did, you know, the first decade of our marriage, we did watch regular TV. We have cut it out in the last, you know, 15 on, or 13 but if you make that okay, your kids think anything's okay. And now the world has changed so drastically, you know, with the inception of the phones and the internet and the YouTube and just all these different ways to watch media. If you open that door, you know, goodness gracious, you've just, and, and that's why we keep our little ones now, well, and Samuel too, in a bubble. Like we just, we just don't allow very much at all because we're so very afraid of them you know, taking off and just it being a free for all. So, right. right. And you also have to, when it comes to that, you have to instill it in their heart because I see a lot of parents who put their kids in that bubble, but they, they don't yes. teach self-control in any area of their life. They don't exactly. teach self-control with eating, um, sure. with just fun, fun things. You know, they don't teach them self-control when it comes to even have the character to do chores. And then when the kid turns 18, 19, they never learned to control anything their parents have forced them. So they had to abide by the rules. Exactly. The right. They get out. It's just crazy. They're trying yep. everything, you know, because they never exactly. lost self-control. So they're like, Ooh, I never got to try alcohol. Let's try this. I never got to smoke. Let's try this. I never got to watch this. Let's watch this rated R movie with all this nudity, you know, exactly. so they're just trying all this stuff. So, you know, I, I do believe in sheltering, but then also teaching that self-control, you know, for when they get out on their own. 
Very true. And Grace and I, you know, early on, we went to Temple Baptist years and years and years ago, big temple in Knoxville. And it's, you know, it's a fine church. Pastor Sexton's a wonderful man. But I remember when we were there, you know, we were so young and just very worldly. And, you know, I was coming out of the SBC church. He's coming out of his, you know, crazy Baptist church. We were just normal kids, really. You know, we get married and, you know, I found Curtis Hudson. We started, you know, going to this independent Baptist church and all these people looked so perfect and just, oh, wow. They were just amazingly beautiful and their lives looked perfect. And, you know, they would preach these standards, you know, at the church that we just felt like we're just, whoa, you know, we're never going to live up to this, but we never really heard the why, you know, I don't remember early on hearing why we have these standards. And so this is an approach that we've taken with our children. Just like you said, it's not just a rule for the sake of having a rule, just so I can control what you do. We actually do explain to our boys why this rule is in place and want them to own it. Just like you said, you know, you should want to have standards that are much higher than the world standards. You know, you should want to be a cut above. You should want to be like Jesus. So we exactly, I agree wholeheartedly with what you say. It shouldn't just be, you know, these, these hard and fast rules because yes, a child will immediately leave home and bust them all. Yep. And I think that's, I think that's the root of the problem. Um, And that's really something that my husband and I have tried to do differently with my children. My husband would ask some of those questions growing up in a pastor's home. Why? Why don't we do this? Why don't we watch this movie? And it was always because I said so. Right. So it was never explained. So our generation kind of um, rebelled against that, I think, because, well, they were never giving us any biblical reason. And that's where we have the recovering fundamentalists. That's the group that came out of that, my generation. And what we've really tried to do is we've tried to explain this is why we have personal standards in our lives. You know, this is why we don't do certain things. And this is why we don't speak this way. And this is why we're different than the world in this area. And we've really tried, you know, honing it so that, like you said, when they're 20, when they're 21, when they're 22, they're going to have hopefully higher standards than us when it comes to. Yes, exactly. So, but then let's go into, um, you know, and obviously I had a few points in there and I'm skipping some of these We're you're doing we're talking, you're giving great points. So, (laughs) you know, have the correct priorities in order with um, raising your kids and raise them in church. We're obviously very, very big proponents of raising them in church. (laughs) So, but then habits of success, I wanted to touch on this really quickly when it comes to being a good church member, because there are um, many things, you know, I mentioned the you're excused of sermon and the little by little, they're both great. But then for us, we determined when our kids were little, when we got married, we determined that we would make church a lifestyle. So nothing comes before church, you know, in our life, that is the number one priority, obviously. And people will say, well, you have to, because you're, you know, he's the pastor or whatever. But even when my husband was just part-time, a part-time assistant pastor at our old church, even before he became a part-time assistant pastor, we were there for everything, you know, every activity, every time there was soul winning, you know, every time the doors were open. So, um, what are some ways in your life that you have, you know, made church a priority or what are some of your tips for those that really want to be a good church member? What are some things you would tell them? Oh, goodness. Well, there we go back to consistency, being consistent. You know, um, I think it's very important to be there, obviously, uh, as much as you can to be involved, to support the pastor and the pastor's wife and their endeavors. If anything, I have learned in the last five years of Grayson doing this job. It's that I was not a good church member before. And it's not that I wasn't in church because I was, I was there for everything, you know, in every church I've ever been in, I've been involved. I've, you know, taught Sunday school or vacation Bible school. I've cleaned, I've had kept the nursery of you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. I've been on the, you know, benevolent committee. I've done whatever needed to be done, but I didn't really understand I didn't really understand the role and the responsibility of the pastor and his wife. And I didn't really realize how important that it is that you just show up for everything. 
every little thing. I just didn't get it because now it's very hard. And I know you probably feel this way too. It's very hard not to take it personally when you plan something awesome or you think it's awesome, you know, at church and people just don't show up yeah. or, you know, like you, I, I didn't, you go to all this trouble and all this work and it's like, nobody really cares. So yeah. I think, and, and I don't know, can you, can you teach that to someone else? I mean, can you, without experiencing it, Cause I'm definitely that person that has to learn my lessons the hard way. And that's exactly what I've done in the last five years. I mean, Grace and I have learned. It's like, we want to go and call every pastor and pastor's wife that we've ever had and be like, we're so sorry that we weren't just these amazing church members that were always there right with you. you know. But, and, and I don't want anybody to think that we were not in church because we were. And I thought I was a great church member. You know, I'm not, I thought I was just like stellar, top of the line. But <laughs> really and truly, I, I could have done so much more. I could have prayed for my pastor more. I could have prayed for my pastor's wife more. I could have understood, you know, the struggles that she had and understood, you know, how hard it is for their family to be in that position, how hard it is for their kids. So, so I don't know, I guess as a good church member, I would just say you need to just invest. And there again, you know, this goes back to our long-term commitments. You talk about being successful as a Christian. I think you have to invest long-term because, you know, like we've talked about, it's a step-by-step process. And, you know, if you're just, you know, half in, if you don't look at it as being, you know, a place where, you know, I'm going to put roots down, I'm going to be here all the time, no matter what. And we do have people like that at our church. We really do. We've got people that never miss anything. And I'm very, very thankful for those people. But I think if you don't have that mindset, then you're really, I don't know, it's, it's you're just, you're missing the mark. And it's like Pastor Boyle said, you know, if it, it, it's fine to, to do that, you can be that kind of person, but you just don't realize what you're missing out on, you know, as, as that church member, you don't realize the blessings, you don't realize the fellowship that you're missing, you don't realize, you know, just the awesome things that go on. You don't realize the impact that you're making on your children, you know, when you're not there for every single thing. So that would be my advice. I know that was probably just a big word salad, but no, it's fine. No, it was great. There were some great points in there. And then I do think um, there is, there is something when you are investing in a smaller church, you know, and we had some pioneers, thankfully, that joined up with us when we started our church plant, not knowing a single soul in Rock Falls. We had yeah. some pioneers that showed up for that first service and are still here almost 11 years later. So awesome. they said, this is my church, you know, putting that stake in the ground yeah. and saying, this is my church. If we have big days, I'm going to be there. If we have small days, I'm going to be there. I'm going to support the pastor. I'm going to support the pastor's life. And yeah. I don't think that's I mean, we're, we're talking about it now, but I don't think people really realize it until they are put into that position. Yeah. They don't, they don't realize all the blood, toil, sweat, and tears. I know Um, I didn't. Yeah, no. And I mean, even starting our church, I think about it those early days. I don't think I'd ever want to do it again. I mean, it was not only did my, was my husband out of work and we had that, um, before he could find a job here, we had that worry. We had the worry of the church. We had this building, we had bills. We were getting a hundred dollar offerings, you know, (laughs) how, but God always came through. I remember something busted on our heater and it was going to be $2,000 to fix. And that was astronomical to us. We're this tiny church plant with like 20 people. How are we going to come? We can't even barely pay the electric bill. And a church sent us a check for almost exactly what we needed to cover that. So they said, God put it on our heart. So we're sending this for you. And it was exactly what we needed to cover that awesome $2,000, that bill. So God always comes through. Um, I know for one thing, we never wanted to move around a lot when we started having kids. So we were at Lighthouse for 10 years before we started this church. And now we will be here 11 years with this church. And we really wanted to raise our kids in one church, basically. So that is one piece of advice I would give to parents who are having children. It's really hard. My son's still, he's 20 and a half, but he still talks about how hard it was on him when we moved from Lighthouse and and we came here to start this church. And he said, mom, if you guys would, if I would have been like older and you were just moving me around all the, you know, like you were talking about with Tristan exactly around the churches, he's like, it really would have affected me. Exactly. It does. It takes a great toll on your children. It just, I don't know. They need that consistency. They need that feeling of, you know, this is where I belong. Or I think they grow up with just this, you know, 
scattered, I don't know, no commitment really. Well, and they're seeing how they're not seeing stable relationships grow and take root and really flourish. Relationships yeah. with people take a lot of time. So if you go to a church and every four years you're leaving and going to another, you're yes. starting over with new relationships. Exactly. So that is really, really tough. And I found with church people, I wrote something about it um, on Facebook not too long ago. It seems like there's kind of a cycle with people about every four years, people get to know them, learn their faults, you know, because we yeah. all got them, you know, maybe you're not a good enough pastor's wife and people just now discover this after four years, right? I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, and you discover that they're not perfect. So they, they move for a fresh start where no one knows them, but then after four or five years, people are going to get to know them there too. And then it's time for a new church. So I've seen that pattern in a lot of people's lives. So, um, you know, I would say for women to just recognize all the hard work that your pastor or your pastor's wife has done. Um, none of us, you don't like tooting your own horn. I don't like tooting my own horn. But there are certain days that are special to a pastor and his wife, um, such as the church anniversary. You know, I'm sure when that rolls around for you guys, have you been there? It'll be six years this year. It was actually just recently five years that the church had started. Yeah, it was at the very beginning of June. So, yeah, it's a little baby still and our church is almost 11. So we're like getting close to teenage years now. So, (laughs) but yeah, definitely. Um. It is nice to be acknowledged. It is nice when hard work is acknowledged. Yeah, so absolutely. If you are from Miss Dana's church. I, I hope you acknowledge the anniversary. It's, <laughs> it's done and it's gone. Even something like a card with a nice note that really helps brighten my day. You know, a gift yeah. card to her favorite coffee place or whatever it is, you know, recognize those special days. It really does mean a lot. Um, yeah. I think a lot of pastors and their families experience burnout because they are taken for granted. No one really cares. Well, you're getting paid, right? It's your job, but right. it's much more than a job to a pastor and his wife. It's their entire life. Church That's is exactly there. right. Yeah. You can't separate your life from it. That's no. exactly right. No, it, it fills up every amount of space and time. It, it really does. Yeah. Yeah. And even when you're home, you're still thinking about what's going on at church? Do I need supplies? You know, exactly. do, do I need this? Does this need to happen in the church? Is this lady? Okay. She seemed a little yeah. off Sunday. I need to reach out to this person. This exactly. person's parent just died. I need to make sure that I talk to them. You know, I yep. find, call this person. So it's always there. It's always there. Yeah. hundred percent. So just try to remember that when it comes to being a church member, but let's finish it up. I know we've gone in an hour. Um, success in life overall, not even so much as being a Christian, but what has, what has worked in your life as far as, um, relationships, you know, um, taking care of what you have, you know, just you guys own a house. We do. We own our home. We've been here 16 years and just last week finished our basement. Finally. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so yes, we've been here 16 years in the same spot. You know, we, we love it here. We actually considered moving last year. Just, you know, we kind of got on that bandwagon of, Oh, do we want a lot of land? Do we want this? But I don't know. We're, we're happy where we're at. We have the most wonderful neighbors. So yeah, um, we do own a home success in life in general. Sam and I are actually doing the Dave Ramsey personal finance class right now for high schoolers. It's time. So he's a senior this year. And so he's got his own bank account, things like that. And, and I'm not like, you know, trying to sell you or sell anybody on Dave Ramsey, but it is a good little program just as far as us. He has helped us. So I think it's great. Yeah. And it's great for a teenager to hear about, you know, just and the, the thing is, yes, Dave Ramsey's about building wealth. That's how he's, you know, made his money and everything. But what he talks about more than anything else is taking a look in the mirror at yourself and owning your behavior. And I think success in life, I just watched it this morning. So that's why it's fresh in my mind. Success in life really is about knowing yourself, knowing who you are, uh, getting to the point where you see yourself for who you are and you can change things as you go. You can fix things as you go and not just, you know, getting set in your ways and, you know, or being prideful or whatever. It's being able to still grow, you know, and still learn and still, you know, make positive changes in your life. I want more, more than anything else. And this has been, you know, sort of a, 
a trial for me, I guess, is, you know, I went through a very selfish period of time, I guess, you know, Grace and I both did really, you know, and, and, and we're, we've come out of that and tried to really, you know, make sure that we're investing in other people, you know, that, and I think that, that pastoring this church is, has helped so much with that because it's all about service to other people, you know, just making your life so much less about yourself, which is what Jesus wants us to do anyway. So, you know, I've tried to really invest in my relationship with my parents, you know, and my dad is, is 76. My mom will be 70 at the end of the month. And I know that, you know, my days are probably numbered with them. So we try to do a lot, you know, with, with my family, with Grayson's mother, his mom is still here. And both my parents set great examples, like, or our parents, my parents are married 51 years. Grayson's parents were married 53 years, I think, when Grayson's dad passed away. Um, so I do think that it's important to keep your relationship strong, you know, to make sure that you don't just write everybody off and just live your life selfishly, uh, that you set that example for your children, you know, that it, these people are more important than, you know, what you or I want. And, uh, because I think that you'll reap that in the end of your life. You know, if you've lived your life in a way that your children see that you've always put others first, then when you're older, your children are going to put others first, including you. You know, we, we, we Grace and I ain't going to have no retirement. So we're going to be totally dependent upon our children to <laughs> you know, make sure that we're not, you know, stuffed in a nursing home somewhere. So yeah, we want, yeah, we want them to, you know, love our family and love us and see the way that we take care of our own families. So I don't know. There are so many ways to say that, you know, you've lived a successful life or that you've left a legacy. That's probably just a very, small one that I can think of. There's so many topics we could even just delve into off of yep. this some point topics, but yeah, yep. I like what you said about relationships. I do think, um, as Americans, we are, I don't know if it's the social media world that's kind of influenced it with all of your hundreds of fake friends that yep. follow you, but we have really, um, come to the point where it's easy to burn relationships. And I think yep. a lot of people do that, not realizing what they're doing. So exactly. Uh, I know relationships are very important to me. You know, after, as soon as we're done, I'm headed off to my best friend's house. Yeah. Best friends since we were 12. So very, very long-term relationship. And that'll never end uh, that I will never burn that relationship. She would never burn that relationship. It's very, very important to us. And yeah. I feel that way with many of the relationships in my life, even with church members or, you know, Julia said that <laughs> she's constantly telling Chris, this is our church. They come here to church and this is their kid's church. And she's not starting over. <laughs> and All I'm right. glad, you know, she has that mindset. And for her, it's harder to make close friends. And, you know, we yeah. do have that close community of like-minded women here where we can lean on each other and learn from each other and help each other through the hard patches in life. And I think that's so important. And, um, you know, to be a successful person, it, it is to have long-term relationships, right? That is part of it. So, yeah, I think it's just, you know, to have the kind of character that, you know, people will reflect on your life and say, you know what, and they were always good to everybody. They were always, you know, I have a tendency to be critical and something I catch myself doing a lot. You know, I don't want to be so critical in front of my kids that they just think, Oh, mom's always dissatisfied with everything. And you know, she's always thinking, you know, this is bad or that is bad. So, you know, in the last few years, I've tried to really check myself and not be just, I've tried to really extend grace and really extend mercy and really extend understanding to those around me because I don't want my kids to grow up with this attitude that everybody's wrong, everybody's bad, everybody, you know, and that people are not valuable. I want people to be valuable to them, everybody, because that's, you know, Jesus believes that everybody's valuable. So I want my kids to believe that everybody's valuable. So mm -hmm. that's a huge thing for me too. I love that. All right. Well, ladies, I'm going to have to go because my little one needs a nap. I just got a text saying she is <laughs> not well, my phone's about to die. So that's okay. good. I got to go. Through. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. And I'm sure we'll have you on again. You had a lot of great points, a lot of great advice. So we need um, to set us some time to do this just to talk. Why don't we do this more often? No, no, like, we're just going to start scheduling coffee dates yes. over yeah. the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that with a lot of my friends. We do Zoom calls. So yeah. it, it's a great way to talk, but Thank you for joining. Hang on. I'm going to say goodbye to everyone and um, get this off. So bye ladies. I will hopefully